From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 214, recorded on February 23, 2023. Rack and Yellow, and joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello there, Vincent, and everybody else. Um, lousy weather out here today, um, 40 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, overcast, sleet, uh, rain, just a beautiful day for staying indoors and creating something unusual. Also joining us from 70 miles north of Venezuela, Daniel Griffin. <laughs> You know, it was 50 miles a minute ago, so I must be moving. Um, I'm <laughs> sorry, everyone. Play tectonics, play tectonics. <laughs> 20 miles, what's the difference? <laughs> and from Glasgow, Scotland, Christina Naula. Hello, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's been a beautiful day today, so for once. Nice. What an international crew we have. Our guest today is from Cologne, Germany. Kai Schaefer, welcome to TWIP. Thank you very much for uh, being there to be your guest uh, this evening. Uh, I'm very honored. Here it is midnight. It's pitch dark. Uh, we have about uh, <laughs> seven degrees plus. Uh, and um, yes, I'm happy to be with you tonight. Feeling as uh, usual. Very nice. Cologne, Germany. Excellent. What It is amazing, Daniel, what we've got assembled here, the, the master of technology. So... It, uh, it is sort so of amazing, right? We've got people from spotted all around, all around so in yeah. different time zones. So these are parasitologists. So Kai, I appreciate you staying up late. <laughs> no, Daniel, these are, we are parasitologists without borders. <laughs> yeah, right. you know, we, we, by the way, we just finished Carnival here, so uh, oh, right. I don't know about uh, German culture, uh, and Cologne is really the center of Carnival, and Dusseldorf and Mainz as well, but for five days uh, we Ooh. had uh, ongoing parties and um, lots of drinking, lots of dancing, and we were really enjoying ourselves. That sounds great. But okay. this, 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 ca this came up, and hopefully you can answer the question. Um, in Germany, is more beer or wine consumed? Ah. Good question. <laughs> I think it's, it's more beer. No, <laughs> the answer, I, have so much, no. I have a glass Kai. of Riesling here. <laughs> Kai, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. So should we get get going Let's with the go, case Daniel. and then at the very ahead, end Daniel. of the emails, uh, Kai, we're yeah. going to introduce you. So uh, we will start off with our case uh, from TWIP213. So for those of you uh, tuning in for the first time or those of you tuning back in, we had a 49-year-old uh, German male seen with significant gross hematuria. Uh, he had reported no travel outside of Europe, uh, but did report that he visited France twice, seven years before and one year before. Um, he reported swimming in the Solanzara River in the southeastern part of the island near a busy campsite. He might have gone into the Gravona River in western Corsica near uh, JCO at a turtle park and near a campsite and at the Tavig Nano River. The patient also reported swimming in the Restonica River. He reported never swimming in the Cabo River and using GPS data from his smartphone and camera, um, he reconstructed his bathing sites precisely and this history was confirmed. The exam was unremarkable. Complete blood count was unremarkable and did not show eosinophilia. This complaint triggered cystoscopy and biopsies that were sent for histological analysis. These findings triggered a referral to the Tropical Medicine Department at LMU Hospital Munich. Uh, now, as I mentioned last time, uh, we have a guest who was involved in this case who's going to tell us a little bit more um, once we get through the emails. All right, we have quite a few this time. Dixon, can you start off, please? <clears throat> I would be happy to. Uh, Amber writes, 
Good afternoon, TWIP team. It's a frosty minus 22 degrees Celsius with a wind chill of minus 34 here in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Luckily, it's going back up to plus 2 Celsius tomorrow. That sounds encouraging. I'm a longtime listener of TWIP and all the other Microbe TV podcasts, but this is my first time emailing you. I have an MS in plant and soil biology, but I absolutely adore the parasitology course I took in my undergrad, so TWIP is a real treat for me. I searched Google for parasites of Corsica causing hematuria and was rewarded with an article in Emerging Infectious Diseases entitled Developing Endemicity of Schistosomiasis Corsica France. <clears throat> it was on the PubMed Central site, and it appears to describe Dr. Griffin's exact case study, a 49-year-old German male with hematuria after a trip to Corsica. He appears to have been infected with a hybrid parasite, Schistosoma hematobium and Schistosoma bovis, which uh, was apparently responsible for a Schistosomiasis outbreak in Cor Cor Corsica in 2013. It goes on to say that although no previous cases for Solenzara River have been documented, Bulinus trunculatus <clears throat> snails and their DNA have been found there through experimental sampling. This is the intermediate host species for these schistosomes, and their density around the patient's primary bathing site was high. Based on this article, I'm going with schistosoma species infection as a diagnosis. According to the CDC, treatment for urinary and intestinal schistosomiasis is one to two days of praziquantel. Thanks for everything you do at Microbe TV. You all helped me get through the pandemic and stay sane. <clears throat> I am presently enjoying Dr. Racaniello's Columbia Virology course for the third time. There's something new every year. Oh, I hope I can win a copy of Parasitic Diseases 7th edition. All the best in 2023. Daniel. <clears throat> All right. Yosef writes, Dear Twip Tetrad, longtime listener, first time emailer. I started listening to Twip when I was an undergrad at Penn State studying molecular biology. Six years later, I am in the fourth of hopefully eight years in the MD-PhD program at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina. While my current PhD research lies in the field of liver biology and metabolism, I love listening to the Twix podcast to get my dose of infectious disease content while waiting for Western blots to develop. <laughs> Oh, I believe dear. a 49-year-old German man with gross hematuria and a history of freshwater exposure during travel to Corsica is suffering from schistosomiasis caused by schistosoma hematobium. An outbreak of schistosomiasis occurred in Corsica in 2013, described here in a 2016 article, and was traced to infection foci in the Kabu River. The patient in our case study described swimming practically everywhere except the Kabu, but I think it's conceivable that following the initial outbreak, the parasites have spread to other rivers via endemic freshwater snails and river-hopping human hosts. The 2013 study demonstrated that at least in laboratory conditions, snails indigenous to Corsican rivers could become infected with schistosomes, which supports this theory. Interesting. Sequence analysis of schistosoma species from the outbreak led the researchers to conclude that the parasites had likely traveled to Corsica from West Africa, specifically Senegal. It's amazing what molecular biology can do. The diagnosis could be confirmed by identifying the presence of eggs with a hallmark terminal spine in the urine. Alternatively, serological testing for antibodies against the adult worms could be employed. Treatment would consist of a two-dose uh, regimen of prosequanto given over the course of one day. While one day of treatment is often enough to cure the infection, some patients may require a second treatment two to four weeks after the initial dose to increase the treatment effectiveness. Thank you for all you do. Yosef. Christina. Yeah, all right. Dear sages of microscopic eukaryotes, <laughs> like that. Good day from Sydney, Australia, where the summer is glorious and the cicadas are so light that you can, can't hear yourself think. As, as to the 19th, 49-year-old German male with significant gross hematuria. First, I am sure this would have been a thousand times harder if this wasn't a parasitic, 
parasitic focused show. I have approached this first by looking at parasites in France, Corsica, which may cause hematuria. A quick search returned the following list. Schistosoma mansoni, Echinococcus granulosus, Toxoplasma gondii, and Entamoeba histolytica. Further examination helped me to filter out the unlikely culprits. Schistosoma mansoni is only known in mainland France, but not on the island of Corsica. Toxoplasma gondii normally, as far as I know, infects the brain, skeletal muscles and eyes. It would also result in flu-like symptoms, which the gentleman has not reported. Endamoeba histolytica looked possible at the first glance. It is an amoeba, so it could be easily transferred into the in the unsanitary conditions of a campsite. However, it would have been infected mainly the gut, and the gentleman has not reported any gut symptoms. Echinococcus granulosus, I really hope it was not alveolar echinococcosis, however looks likely. It is caused by the larvae stage of the tapeworm. The host is the dog with the infection occurring when the dog eats an intermediary's host internal organs. This could easily contaminate the river. From the CDC website, Echinococcus granulosus often remains asymptomatic until hydatid cysts containing the larval parasites grow large enough to cause discomfort, pain, nausea and vomiting. The cysts grow over the course of several years before reaching maturity and the rate at which symptoms appear typically depends on the location of the cyst. The cysts are mainly found in the liver and lungs, but can also appear in the spleen, kidneys, heart, bone and central nervous system, including the brain and eyes. I would assume a cyst in the kidney has ruptured, resulting in hematuria. Recommended treatment is surgery to remove the cysts and albendazole, 400 mix orally twice a day for one to six months to kill any other parasites in the body or any eggs that might spill from the removed cysts. Hmm. Question, would it be required to scan the lungs, heart and CNS for other cysts? Thanks, Eyal. Unfortunately, my guest was not read out last month, but I still want to share with you an amazing sunset we experienced while camping, camping by Mayal Lake. No schistosomiasis in sight over Christmas. <laughs> and it is a really beautiful purple, red. Um, it's gorgeous. I'd like to be there that just spe- now. That is spectacular. <laughs> it is. Daniel, would you have to towel off vigorously after coming out of that? I don't think if there was, uh, you know, if there were no schistosomes in there, it would be all good. <laughs> <laughs> I, Kai, I don't know if you know the joke, but when I went to uh, Lake Malawi with the family, you know, I initially warned them, you know, you can't go in the water because schistosomiasis, the bilharzia. And then we got there and it was just really hot. And, you know, my kids all wanted to go in. I'm like, all right, you can all go in, but you just have to towel off vigorously when you get out. <laughs> 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 well, there's a famous spot, uh, Lake Malawi. I've been there several times. Cape McClear. Uh, I think that's where you have been most likely. Yeah. 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 And there was a lifeguard there. And I asked that, you know, I asked the lad, um, so do you know how to swim? He said, no, no. I said, so how, how will you save us? He goes, oh, no. I just stand here. And when the crocodiles get too close, I yell <laughs> and you must run. <laughs> 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 Daniel, don't worry, the hippos know. the hippos will eat them. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's what Barnaby tells me. I'm not worried about the crits, the hippos, Daddy. I'm like, all right. Absolutely. <laughs> They're the killer number one in Africa. <laughs> exactly. Hippos. And the number two, I think, is uh, cobras. Um, or malaria, probably. Well, <laughs> regarding animals, you're yeah. probably right. <laughs> all right. Hacon, but you right. know the, the major uh, killer uh, in Africa for white people? Mm. Road traffic accidents? Absolutely. Uh, traffic Absolutely. Accidents. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. All right. Hakone writes, first time listener, second year vet student at UGA on the wildlife disease track with hope to become a board certified parasitologist following my graduation. Having recently gone down a rabbit hole of reading about schistosoma hematobium and mouse models attempting to replicate infection in humans, I was actually supposed to be compiling references for a paper on (laughs) clonostomum species when I heard urinary tract and Mediterranean region Corsica on your podcast about parasites 
my mind went to this particular trematode. Given this guess, it would be prudent to examine the urine sediment for ova to confirm as well as run a PCR for confirmation. Treatment would be quasi-quantal, assuming it's the same for human medicine. From there, I did a little research to confirm this theory, and I think I may have found the exact case you referenced on the NCBI website. and provides a link. Was not aware that hybridization between the human schistosomiasis and cattle varieties hybridized as commonly as this paper suggests. Very cool stuff. Hopefully, I turn this in in time for the book. I'm looking forward to meeting some of the TWIP cast this summer at the ASV conference. Heck, Cone. Interesting. All right, we're back to Dick's. Kai. Kai, do you have Kai the notes? Do we, let, do we make Kai do some work? Kai, do you have the, well, um, uh, the emails in uh, front of you? Um, I Let me see. Um, he's Sorry, I just the, assumed. He's not on the Google Doc. That's why I, okay. you know. No, that's okay. I'm not sorry. So, all right. Kai, you're off the hook for a while. So, so Dick's <laughs> <next. laughs> <Dixon, laughs> next. All right, I'm back on the hook. <laughs> Back on the hook. <laughs> Bren writes, uh, Aloha, twip, Twippers. It's 76 degrees Fahrenheit and balmy here on the beautiful island of Oahu. I have just stumbled across this podcast and have, been, have decided to flex my Google skills. My suspected diagnosis would be a parasitic infection by Schistosoma hebentobium as its geographic distribution includes Corsica, France, according to the World Health Organization. To confirm this diagnosis, I would attempt to detect parasitic eggs in a urine sample, and if confirmed, treat with praziquantel. Then I would go back to balancing my spreadsheets, as I am not a medical professional. Okay. <laughs> Bren. All right, Daniel. All right, Marcus writes, Hi all, for once I'm not too late, I have previously gone on far two long tangents with these case guesses, but will try and likely fail to keep it short. I've been listening to it long enough to know that swimming in Lake Victoria equals schistosomiasis. Further that, in addition to denial being a river in Egypt, the river carries S. hematobium. Now, if you are swimming in freshwater in those areas and a while later develop macro hematuria, the answer would be clear, S. hematobium and possibly squamous cell carcinoma secondary to the infection unlike other bladder cancers, which are usually urothelial adenocarcinomas. That is a good, good point there. However, this guy was in Corsica. We don't do human schistosomes. We do have avian schistosomes causing swimmer's itch in Europe, or do we? Oh, yes, we do. Multiple cases of local transmission and actual outbreaks of schistosomiasis have been reported in Corsica, specifically in Cabo River, which our patient claims not to have entered, but likely also in Solanzara and Restonica rivers, where he did swim. So depending on the cystoscopy and biopsy, treat for schistosomiasis with praziquantel and possibly a bladder SCC with cystoscopy with lymph node dissection if low grade after radiographic examination. Um, that was squamous cell carcinoma. Hopefully you are well. Thanks for helping me through. C-TROP Med, Marcus. Christina. Okay, shall I do two? Because the next one is really short. Sure. Dear Do Joshua writes, Dear doctors, I will simply guess schistosomiasis again, as a quick Google revealed this disease has recently become endemic in Corsica. My guess for the last twip wasn't read, but perhaps perhaps I had mislabeled it. In case it is of any interest, I append it below. Um, so I'll skip. It's not here, so I wasn't going to read that anyway. But then we have Derek. Derek writes, Hello, Twip. My name is Derek, and as a Floridian undergrad, I might stand out from the usually more qualified submitters. Still, my introduction to parasitology professor sparked my interest on this subject, and your podcast has only furthered it. Speaking of my professor, on the off chance he listens to this podcast, shout out to Professor Paul Sharp. I hope a correct diagnosis can translate in to an extra credit point or two. At the very least, remember my name when you're looking for new TAs. Now on to the case. The first symptoms, gross hematuria, tells me that this particular parasite likely targets the human kidney or bladder. I figure the kidney is a more likely culprit as a parasite searching for high concentrations of water and useful biological material like sodium would likely end up there. Alternatively, bloody urine could simply be a signal that the parasite is targeting another organ and then excretes its egg through the urine of its host. 
Considering the patient has been swimming around southeastern France and that was the likely cause of infection, I figured the pathogen most likely belongs to the genus Schistosoma. Freshwater rivers likely have freshwater snails and freshwater snails likely have Schistosoma ready to bury themselves into the skin. Googling schistosoma bloody urine tells me that the most likely schistosoma that causes bloody urine and a lack of other symptoms is S. hematobium, otherwise known, otherwise known as the urinary blood fluke. This nasty little guy targets the various plexus, a concentration of veins, venous plexus, a concentration of veins around the urinary bladder and released eggs travel to the wall of the urine bladder, according to Wikipedia. My first qualm with this diagnosis was that this particular patient has visited rivers, which in my head are usually fast moving and not snail friendly. Searching pictures of these locations dashed these worries as there seem to be locations with stagnant snail friendly water. This all seems good, but to double check, I googled S. hematobium infections in France. Guess what popped up? According to to PubMed and the European Centre for Disease Control, cases of S. hematobium are not unheard of in, drumroll please, Corsica. In fact, from June 16, 2014 to June 4, 2015, this trematode caused a ban on swimming in the rivers in Corsica. While the ECDC ECDC reports that blindness snails in multiple sites all tested negative for S. hematobium in the summer of 2014, I wouldn't be surprised if the pathogen has reared its head once again in Corsica at the time of our unfortunate patient's trip. Urological examination will likely result in observable eggs and serology examinations, for example ELISA, will also likely point to whether S. hematobium is truly the culprit. Treatment may include an anti-inflammatory to alleviate symptoms and likely praziquantel. Enough fun parasitology, time, get, time to get back to organic chemistry. And he lists a few references. Jason writes, greeting TWIP hosts. It's a brisk six degrees Celsius in Seattle as I write this. For the TWIP 213 case of the German man with hematuria, no other symptoms my first inclination was to suspect infection of the perivesical venous plexus of the bladder with schistosoma hematobian. Reflecting on what I know about schistosomiasis, however, I thought I must be mistaken because our patient had traveled only within Europe, and my recollection of S. hematobium endemic range heat maps confines this infectious trematode to its human and snail hosts in Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, and the Tigris-Euphrates river valleys. Turned to the ninth edition of Tropical Medicine and found a differential diagnosis table while there are many infectious and non-infectious etiologies contained in the table, the only parasitic malady there is S. hematobium. Next, I searched CDC Corsica, and the first page that appeared was a traveler's warning on schistosomiasis, which has now been removed for the CDC website. Other online searches for hematuria in parasitic diseases offered cystic echinococcosis as a possibility, but I think that hydatid disease in this case is a bit of a stretch, especially when the case report heavily emphasized the swimming in rivers part of the story and made no mention of contact with canids. Hematuria and malaria was also listed, but it seems improbable that a patient with malaria would not have other signs and symptoms to accompany the hematuria. Therefore, while S. hematobium is not typically an endemic disease of European island, I am pairing the evidence garnered between Hunter's Tropical Medicine and the CDC, making a presumptive diagnosis of S. hematobium infection. Dixon. Now you're muted, Dixon. You forgot to add worm regards, Jason. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> ben writes, the patient likely has, quote, a mixture of schistosoma hematobium, S. bovis, and S. hematobium S. bovis hybrids, unquote. This was reported by the BMC blog, Bug Bitten. BMC, I'm not sure I know what that stands for. British Medical something. Uh, I googled Corsica parasites and found this near the top of the results. The year, method of tracking with phone pictures, and the nationality of those infected matched. If I did not have this article to provide an incredibly detailed answer, I would look for evidence of schistosoma with an antigen test. If present, then further phylogenetic work on the kind of ECDC conducted would be the next step. 
I guess patient treatment would be similar to that of other schistosome species. Then snail and bovid control. Thank you. Ben in D.C. Hey, Dixon BMC is Biomed Central. Didn't know. Now yep. I do. Now, I now do. you do. Now you do. I'm, in, I'm <laughs> informed. I'm well informed. Now. Daniel. <laughs> okay. Rowan writes, Salam from Kuwait. My name is Rowan, and this is my first time writing in. I stumbled upon the TWIV podcast in 2020, of course, and was delighted to find many other podcasts where you guys discuss the fascinating subject of microbiology. I'm currently a third-year clinical microbiology resident at Kuwait Institute of Medical Specialization after taking an eight-year hiatus to stay home with my two children while my husband completed his residency in the United States. I had originally planned a career in public health, but I fell in love with clinical microbiology when I entered the lab for the first time in 2019. <clears throat> the pandemic delayed my plans for a tiny bit, but now I am halfway through the residency and could not be happier. Before I guess the case of the German gentleman symptoms, I would like to comment on a subject that was discussed a couple of podcasts back, tinea solium. Kuwait is an Islamic country where pork is prohibited. Therefore, nobody in the country is able to consume it. And yet we do have cases of cystocercosis. This baffled me when I first knew about it until I learned that the source was from cooks who were originally from countries where pork is a common part of the diet, who then come to work in Kuwait. Now moving on to the case, hematuria of parasitic origin will always raise the flag of schistosoma hematobium in my mind, a parasitic infection caused by swimming in freshwater lakes. A case report from 2014 reported the autochthonous infection of a young boy by schistosoma hematobium after swimming in Corsica, France. The distribution of this parasite naturally depends on the ecology of its intermediate host, the Bolinus snail. Cercariae, released from the infected snails into lakes, will penetrate the human skin, causing a rash called the swimmer's itch roughly 24 hours later and migrate within their new host. The adult worms can be found living in the venous plexus of the urinary bladder, and weeks later, if large amounts of eggs are produced and shed, chronic granulomatous inflammation and fibrosis of the urinary tract occurs, which is the cause of terminal hematuria. Diagnosis is by the detection of eggs in a terminal urine specimen collected between 12 and 2 p.m. Treatment is 40 milligrams per kilogram of prosequanto. That was fun. Thanks so much for everything you do. Rowan Dashti, Kuwait. Christina. Maria writes, hello Twippers, my name is Maria, I'm an infectious disease clinician working at a small community hospital near Buenos Aires in Argentina. I started following the podcast a couple of months ago and I'm slowly working through the early episodes as well as listening to the new ones as they come out. I must say one of the main reasons I got hooked on Twip is that Dr. Depomier reminds me of one of my old teachers back in residency, Dr. Alindo Martino, both in erudition and in narrative pro prowess. On to the case now. The one parasitic infection that comes to mind when faced with gross hematuria is urogenital schistosomiasis, caused by schistosoma hematobium. Differential diagnoses that come to mind are either non-infectious, bladder tumours, kidney stones, IgA nephritis, schönlein hinoch purpura, and non-parasitic, bacterial UTIs including urinary tuberculosis. So when I heard about his travel history, I was stunned for a moment. Reading up on the geographic distribution of S. hematobium, I learned about the outbreak of urogenital schistosomiasis in Corsica in 2013, with its epicenter in the Cavi River. The parasite involved in this outbreak is a hybrid of S. hematobium and S. bovis, and has been endemic in the region ever since. Most cases reported exposure to the Cavi River water, but more recently cases that had been exposed to nearby rivers, such as the Solenzara River, where our German was. There is another report of a small outbreak of urogenital schistosomiasis in Almeria, Spain, and the intermediate host, Bulina snail, has been identified in Portugal, Spain, southern France, Greece and Italy. So, urogenital schistosomiasis caused by S. hematobium crossed with S. bovis acquired in Corsica is my diagnosis. And my guess is the pathology of the bladder biopsy identified granuloma surrounding the eggs. 
The diagnosis could have been made by microscopic examination of the urine and treatment of choice is praziquantel. Thank you for sharing this most interesting case. I can't wait to listen to the resolution. Saludos, Maria. Michelle and Alexander from the First Vienna Parasitology Passion Club write, Dear Shisto Somu ladies and Shisto Somu gentlemen, as indicated by our greeting, we believe that what you have presented here is yet another case of schistosomiasis, this time most likely urogenital schistosomiasis caused by infection with S. hematobium. We base this assumption not only on the typical presentation in history, but also on the fact that we recognize the case, which was published in 2021. The condition known as urogenital schistosomiasis is brought on by S. hematobium worms that lay eggs and live in the veins that drain the bladder, uterus, and cervix. Treatment options depend on the severity of the disease, include treatment with praziquantel or combinations of intravesical chemotherapy, immunotherapy, radiochemotherapy, and surgery in the case of bladder cancer. While staying in Corsica myself last year, I therefore took care not to expose myself to this infection. Granted, visiting, visiting in March when the ambient temperature is around 15 C makes it easier to resist the temptation of jumping into a river. That said, I wholeheartedly recommend visiting the turtle sanctuary, a cupulata near Ajaccio, where the patient also endorsed, which the patient also endorsed. Thank you for this great case. All the best. Michelle and Alexander from the First Vienna Parasitology Passion Club. <laughs> Dixon. Yes. Dear TWIP team, um, uh, Michael writes, Dear TWIP team, my name is Michael, M-A-K-Y-L-E. And I recently started listening to your podcast, and I am excited for it to be added to my podcast repertoire. It's a pretty nice day here in Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm currently a sophomore undergraduate student at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, studying animal science as a part of the school's pre-vet tract. I also happen to work in the diagnostic parasitology lab at the University of Vet School. That said, my parasite knowledge is still fairly basic and mostly animal-based, but I felt it was worth at least trying to make a guess on the show. Thinking about this case, I started with what I know, consulting my borrowed copy of George's 11th edition of the lab in which I work. There are two main parasites that affect the original system in dogs and cats. That's what I am f most familiar with. Oh, Georgie, I re I'm sorry, I know that man. Um, borrowed a copy of Georgie's 11th edition of the lab in which I work. There are two main parasites infected, which I'm not, which I'm most familiar with. First is Personema plica, which can be found in the epithelium of the bladder. If infection is severe enough, it can cause hematuria. But I wasn't able to find much in the way of evidence that humans can be infected. I was therefore pretty quick to set that aside for now. The second parasite is Dictyphyma renale, which will spend time growing in the kidneys and pass eggs through the urine. This parasite can infect humans if they were to ingest a peritonic host. Peritonic hosts for Dr. for D. renale include a number of freshwater fish and amphibians, but infection is rare. Epidemiologically speaking, though, I was not able to find any evidence of dictyphymiasis in Central Europe. Although worth noting that dictyphymiasis is characterized by eosinophilia, which was not described in the patient. So I went ahead and set aside this diagnosis as well. After ruling out C. pica and D. renale, I found myself out of my main area of knowledge, so I consulted the faculty lead of the lab. I work in Dr. Sh John Schaefer, who mentioned that some schistosomes can cause hematuria, though he let me know I'd have to do my own digging to find out more about the specific species, which led me to schistosoma hematobium, which conveniently has been observed in Corsica, France, according to the WHO. So my final answer is schistosomiasis by S. hematobium, which the patient must have contracted on one of his trips to France. I hope I did okay on my first of hopefully many entries to your show. Thank you again for making such an intriguing and educational podcast. Can't wait to hear more. Best regards, Michael. Daniel. Martha writes, Dear Twipsters, I'm behind in my Twix listening. I just listened to episode 213 and realized that the deadline for entries is in two days, so I'm unable to do my usual mulling and ruminating. The urologist made the referral after the biopsy result and not because the cystoscope could not be passed due to an obstruction. So we rule out the Candiru, 
the spiny Amazonian catfish rumored to swim in human orifices. Our swimmer was not in the Amazon, and the snug Speedo should have offered protection from Candora <laughs> encroachment. This takes us back to Corsica and parasites in the rivers. Although the Cavu was the first river to be identified as having schistosomes, it is likely they have spread to the other rivers since the snail needed for the life cycle, Bellinus truncatus, is present in other Corsican rivers. More likely that the parasite was introduced by infected humans or other animal hosts than that the snails made the trek from the Cavu to the Solanzara. So my guess is that the man has schistosomiasis due to S. hematobium and that he will be treated with praziquanto. Best wishes to all in haste, Martha. Christina. Byron writes, hello, Twip hosts. Here we go, another case study. I really enjoyed a monthly case study and please keep it coming. I drive my kid every Sunday to his violin practice, about one hour each way, and it has been my time to consume all the microbe TV podcasts. It's been great. Thought process. It appears it is the cystoscopy and biopsies that seal the diagnosis. So diving into the procedure, cytoscopy and it is endoscopy of the urinary bladder via the urethra. So the biopsy was done from either the urethra or bladder. Next step, Google search parasite causing hematuria. Top results from WHO website. The classic sign of urogenital schistosomiasis is hematuria. Hmm. Could it be the schistosomes? On to the PD7 version. PD version 7 textbook. It has been suggested that cases of hematuria might go back as far as ancient Egypt, causing caused by S. hematobium. The textbook also mentions chronic schistosomiasis can develop hematuria as well as symptoms that mimic urinary tract infection, among other clinic presentations. So far, so good. Everything is pointing to S. hematobium as the culprit. But one more thing, epidemiology. The patient had stayed in Europe the whole time. Does that match up with epidemiology data? Further reading in PD-7 showed S. hematobium is prevalent in most parts of the Middle East. However, an outbreak of S. hematobium was also reported in Corsica, France. That was most likely initiated by an infected individual from Africa. She had migrated there. The small print in the text refers to papers published in 2011 and 2014, and the patient mentioned travel history to Corsica seven years ago. Not sure when this is the case, but 2014 plus seven years could be circa 2021. Seems reasonable. Here we go. I think I'm going with schistosoma hematobium as the diagnosis for this case. Hoping for a book in the future, and thank you for everything you do, educating the public. Christopher writes, hello, TWIP malacologists. <laughs> Could it be possible that the patient presenting with hematuria is one of the people infected with the schistosoma hematobium bovis hybrid that occurred in Corsica, France? This hybrid is capable of causing hematuria as the eggs make their way from the venous plexus of the bladder where the schistosome adults live in the lumen of the bladder. This hybrid also seems better than its, patient, than its parents in infecting each respective snail host, suggesting that it has the potential to outcompete its ancestors out of the water. Quick, short course of prosy should do the trick. Dixon. You're muted. Yes, sir. I just unmuted. I noticed that. Gina writes, uh, I, by the way, I meant to ask you, Vincent, do you know what a malacologist is? I do not. I didn't think you did, the way you read it. <laughs> it's a person who studies snails. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. cool. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Gina's, Gina writes, I'm sorry, but my best guess is just a semiasis again from what meager research skills I have left. Tell Dixon how much we liked office hours with Dixon and Vincent. Let me tell you, Gina, I enjoyed it more than you did, and I think you enjoyed it a lot, and I think Vincent did too. We're probably going to do it again sometime. Uh, Dick, Daniel, you're next. Yep. All right. That was a short one. So I will jump in with Kimona writes. Hello, Kimona. Dear Twip team, with age comes wisdom, but sometimes age comes alone. I love that, actually. <laughs> 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 I clearly I clearly struck out on the last case and I'm I, hoping I, I you get it right this that. time. <laughs> but what are the what are the odds that this month's parasite is from the same genus as last month? First, a few alternative parasitic causes of hematuria in a man who has visited Corsica and swung in many rivers. Trichomon Trichomonas 
a protozoan parasite with worldwide distribution that is mainly transmitted by sexual contact and often asymptomatic. Its lower genitourinary tract symptoms can present as hematuria in males. I imagine Corsica could be a place where a vacationing man might contract such a parasite, but we heard no mention of illicit sexual behavior. Ascaris lumbricoides. This was my wrong answer to last month. Ugh. But I did find a case review presenting with painless hematuria after passing a worm from the urethra, despite Ascaris rarely being found outside the elementary, elementary tract. It does have a worldwide distribution and is associated with poor sanitation, which could certainly be true surrounding campsites. Um, neoplasm, some would argue that cancer is the crudest form of a parasite and can certainly present with painless hematuria when affecting the urinary system, but not a true parasite. So on to my best guess, Schistosoma hematobium, which shares much of its life cycle with the other Schistosome species, penetrating the skin, migrating to the lungs, pairing with a mate in the liver, but its path diverges when the mated hematobium pair migrates and sets up shop in the venous plexus of the bladder, causing egg deposition in any of the urogenital organs and not the liver, as with S. mansoni. With time, this can lead to granular formation and fibrosis and calcified dead eggs in the bladder wall, cause rigidity and obstructive uropathy, leading to hydronephrosis. PD7 also mentions damage in the form of ulcerative lesions in the female genital tract, which unfortunately enhances susceptibility to HIV. It is now felt that reseeding of the rivers by one or more infected bathers is the most likely cause of the endemicity of S. hematobium in Corsica. I hope that my summary above correctly interprets the information I gleaned from our readings and do apologize if not. Treatment in PD-7 is listed mainly as praziquantel, which in acute infections is given after a short course of corticosteroids. Many thanks for prompting yet another deep dive into parasitism. I eagerly await your next parasite reveal. Kimona from southern Vermont, where it is a balmy 41F5C in sunny skies. Christina. Felix writes, Dear Trip team, I hope I'm not too late as I'm just writing on the 16th of February. My initial guess of urogenital schistosomiasis led to some research into the parasitic situation in Corsica. Eventually, I stumbled across a paper by Rothi et al. that describes the case. I am really looking forward to this episode to hear some more interesting facts about the toppings. Topic. Greetings from Germany. And and I can do the next one if you want because well, it was a, short. The last one. Let me do the last okay. one. Hello, Vincent, Daniel, Christina, and Dixon. My name is Daniel. I'm a medical doctor working in an emergency department in a South African hospital. On hearing of a patient presenting with painless hematuria who has had exposure to fresh water, this immediately brought to mind schistosoma hematobium. I worked for a year in an anatomical pathology department where we saw many cases of schistosoma ova in histological specimens and various organ specimens, including bladder, genital tract organs, and intestinal biopsies. I did not know of cases in Corsica. When I did a Google search, I was surprised to see an article by Roth, Zimmer, and Boissier entitled Developing Endemicity of Schistosomiasis, Corsica, France. So my guess is schistosomiasis in particular. I believe the case that was presented in the podcast is the same case in the article which describes a man infected with a hybrid species of S. hematobium and S. bovis. Thank you all again for your wonderful podcasts. All right. I had a lot of guesses this year. Very good. Indeed. Indeed. Well, <laughs> the, the reason why I selected this case was that, um, as you know, um, we got the intermediate hosts there already, you know, but we get more and more immigrants coming to Europe, you know, mm -hmm. oh. and uh, most likely uh, the uh, schistosomiasis hematobium, schistosomiasis bovis was introduced by West African immigrants, most likely from Senegal. And uh, when I was uh, based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, Professor Maybe said, uh, medicine is based on probabilities. And 30 years ago, I would never have thought of contracting schistosomiasis in Corsica. 
but the times have changed. And nowadays we see schistosomiasis in Corsica, we have dengue fever in southern France, uh, we have chikungunya in, uh, in Italy, in Ravenna area, we have had that, and uh, of course uh, malaria in Greece and other parts. So um, due to an influx of immigrants, but also due to um, global warming, Tropical infectious diseases, you know, are coming to our regions, you know, and it is of uh, major concern uh, also to the doctors. And um, and I uh, was based myself for many years in Malawi. Uh, actually, I did research on schistosomiasis hematobium. <laughs> I compared different uh, ELISA techniques. Uh, that was uh, in, 82, in 1982 uh, in the Malamulu Mission Hospital, uh, where I was based. And uh, then I finished my studies in Berlin and went to London and afterwards to uh, did some research on visual leishmanizers, my PhD project uh, in Kenya. And then I returned from Kenya to, to Germany. I was living there for four years uh, in the bush and I, I got spoiled. I published a lot and I got spoiled and, and somehow I didn't fit anymore in a hospital or um, a practice. You know, I, I was, um, I was, a, I am a free spirit. And then I, I founded Trop Medex. Uh, it stands for Tropical Medicine Excursions, because um, what were my assets after having lived for so many years in Africa? I knew about Africa, about how to organize things. I knew about uh, tropical infectious diseases. Uh, and um, so I invented Tropmedics in 1995. Uh, what my idea was that due to... Um, global warming due to uh, many other things. You know, there was a growing need you know, also to teach tro um, uh, healthcare professionals on clinical tropical medicine in the tropics. So uh, I selected th uh, three different countries, all English speaking countries, uh, Ghana, and uh, Uganda, Tanzania, initially was also Kenya uh, involved. Uh, and uh, my group has maximum 13 uh, healthcare professionals that come from all over the globe. And for 12 days, roughly 12 days, we travel into the endemic regions. Uh, we go into visit hospitals, we attend ward rounds. Uh, we do um, field excursions, laboratory manuals, and lectures in English, so that, that they get um, an approach to tropical infectious diseases. But they also see how diseases develop, you know, so also we visit a freshwater lake, uh, or we go on to see um, a national park where the, um, <clears throat> we see uh, the animal reservoir for sleeping sickness. So it is a round trip excursions, you know, the main <clears throat> objective is that they get clinical experience, but at the same time, they see also a bit of, of the countryside and they see also how diseases develop. And I do that for more than uh, nearly 30 years mm -hmm. and uh, it is ongoing and uh, I still love what I'm doing. Sure. <laughs> so our, our listeners probably know that I've actually traveled with uh, Kai a couple times. I uh, spent some time with him in Ghana. And then recently, uh, after spending some time at the clinic in Baduda, I met up with Kai uh, actually at the Cerrijos uh, guest house, right? Right, right? right where I was recording some of my episodes before I uh, uh, left the clinic in, in Baduda and ended up traveling around. But uh, mm. So, so this case, um, I, 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 th I think we kind of have some uh, emailers who kind of uh, got yeah. it correct. Um, what do you think, Kai? Do you, do you think it was actually the case of schistosomiasis, the hybrid? Yes. <laughs> well, this, is, this is also pretty straightforward. I mean, from publications, we know uh, that uh, this trematode is already endemic in Corsica, you know, uh, and uh, well, seeing um, a, a reading uh, someone who has been to Corsica for some weeks <clears throat> and has 
no other symptoms apart from macrohematuria, um, yes, it is very likely it is schistosomiasis hematobium, and it also was confirmed. Uh, and uh, it is a straightforward case to my mind, um, and uh, the, the treatment of choice is Pratsequantra. Um, of course, uh, everyone who travels to Corsica, yes, should be really aware, you know, not to bath, of course, in fresh water ponds, you know, ponds, the freshwater ponds are very famous in Corsica because uh, a lot of people visit Corsica, they like to climb the mountains, you know, and it becomes very, very hot and dry, you know, and they have these amazing ponds, you know, um, and that's where a lot of people like to swim. So be aware don't go in. This is a message <laughs> I want to pass on. <laughs> or towel yourself off, off vigorously afterwards, yeah, I very, suppose. Yeah, very vigorously, right? <laughs> Kai, Kai, do you think it's unusual for this person not to have an eosinophilia? Um, well, as, as we know, you know, usually you got eosinophilia, but you know, there are always exceptions to the rule, you know, and... Um, we have to take it as it is. But I would, uh, in such a case, with such macrohematuria, so heavy infection, I would suspect eosinophilia. Yeah. This is my experience. So, so Kai, how much time do you spend um, in, in Germany versus at TropMedX? Oh, okay, I, I'm, I still got a young, young daughter. She's 12 years old. I'm 62 now, so I did that for 30 years. <laughs> so I'm, I'm um, cutting down. I'm only I'm just doing now two trips per year instead of three, you know. So um, I still love what I'm doing. Um, so actually, I'm off to Tanzania on the 1st of March for, for three weeks. So I always do about <clears throat> 12 days of preparations and then the doctors come. The trips are fully booked. Um, the thing actually is that's, also, that's very striking, you know, since I'm doing it for that long. Um, now the, the, the children of the medical doctors join my trips which I think is it's a great idea to show young people um, what life or what medicine is out there. You know, I think for for a 25 or 26 year old chap, you know, to see a different world, uh, get a different medical experience and um, it broadens uh, his spectrum for the future. <laughs> So I, I, to answer your question, um, well, I spent now more and more time in, in Germany, in Cologne. It's my home. It's my base. I'm happy there. But I still love Africa. <laughs> so <laughs> so and I'm, I think I would like to do it for another seven, eight years, you know, and uh, then uh, and, in reality, I'm looking for a successor uh, in the next three, four, five years. Uh, so if you know some, it's a, I think if you, you need some talent in organization, you need some skills in uh, language, so you know a bit of Skiswahili, um, you should know a bit of about tropical medicine. You know, you should know a bit of about psychology because a group of 13 <laughs> individuals joining or uh, coming from all over the globe, you know, um, it is it is a challenge, but um, probably Daniel can answer that. In, usually I think I, I perform pretty well, although you never know who joins the course, you know, um, but um, I think I would like to do it for another for a couple of years and then hand it over. I think it is a, it is a great idea. It is a, it is a, an idea because it is um, more more needed because we will see more and more tropical infectious diseases uh, in uh, in our areas as well. You know, and we need doctors who have seen you got the experience and to diagnose and to treat such yeah. cases. Absolutely. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's interesting. Um, I, I'm sort of thinking about who can step into Kai's um, Kai's shoes, so to speak. And it's a challenge because a lot of courses, you know, you go, you're set up at a hospital, you know, you stay in whatever your lodging is, and you go each day. 
But these excursions, you're actually going, you know, you may be going to these different hospitals, but you're also going to, you know, the river where, you know, people are getting um, river blindness. You're going to the small villages. You're you're meeting with the, the town elders. You're getting okay from the chief. Um, so rather than just seeing cases in a, say, clinical environment, you're also getting the whole experience of the country. You know, in Ghana, you're learning about the golden stool. You're learning about the culture. You're you're understanding where the diseases fit in in the um, in the context. And it's it's going to be hard, I think, for someone to who's you know not only um, expert in tropical medicine, but also someone who has that ability to have relationships. I mean, um, you know, one of the things with our trip to Ghana is I ended up with a relationship with um, a dermatologist. Um, who was actually um, the one who was taking care of that little girl that we, I think we talked about with the MPOX. And then because of another connection um, at a research, um, co- or there was Kamuza. Am I pronouncing that right, Kai? Um, uh, Kumasi. The Kumasi, yes, the Kumasi mm-hmm. uh, Regional Reference Lab. This ended up leading to, you know, CDC getting involved, and we ended up getting diagnostic tests brought to five of the West African countries. So th- there's so much here, and I think it is, you know, it's sort of a bit of a plug for Tropmedics. But um, it's not just a course where you're just seeing tons and tons of cases. You're actually getting the context. You're meeting people. If you want, you're creating relationships that, you know, you can return. Um, it, it's. It, I think it's going to be a challenge for someone to step into these footsteps and uh, and, and, and <laughs> well, you know because well, it is see, such I, a big I, experience. <laughs> I I invented that because it it fits my my capabilities, you know, and I loved and I still love what I'm doing, you know, and I think I do it with enthusiasm and with passion, you know, and uh, and um, who knows, you know, but maybe it's a great opportunity here to tell you, yes, in in a couple of years time, you know, I, th- I still want to do it till seventy, but I think you have to uh, to put someone in place, you know to prepare it you know and um it, it is a great job it's a great opportunity um and yes i just pass on that message to you <laughs> <laughs> well i think our audience right is full of people that would love this kind of uh, you know they love <laughs> yeah. parasites they'd love to actually see cases in the context so yeah yeah yeah, it is also, you know, you, you get a cross section of the healthcare system. This is also very exciting. So we see government hospitals, you know, so we see uh, different, we see also research centers, you know, we see different uh, institutes uh, and mission hospitals. So you get a cross section of the healthcare system and uh, you see how diseases develop also. They, I think that's also what strikes people, you know, they, they, they won't forget it, you know, because they have seen it that's live. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Kai, do you think you could you meet Kai? <clears throat> Sorry? Sorry. So it was oh so yeah, actually Dixon, you go first and then I'll jump in with the Yeah, I was just gonna suggest, Dixon. Kai, that we've got a lot of books that need to be given away uh, and wondered if you could use them in your uh, group. Um free, the, absolutely the, free. The book you you sent me, Daniel. Yes, did you get the book? Yes, yes. Um, well, th- that may be an, an opportunity. You mean that I I, um, I send you the list of my uh, participants and then you send uh, the books to them? Yeah, actually, the last couple trips, so the Uganda trip and the Ghana trip, actually, um, we ended up sending books to most of the participants because once they, oh, that's great. you know, it's that's interesting. Great. You send it ahead of time. And they're like, I don't know what this is. But then they come back from the trip and they're just full of all this excitement and they want to learn more. And, uh, yeah, I'm getting WhatsApp messages. Where's my book? It hasn't shown up yet. You know, my <laughs> friends in Luxembourg have their book. Where's mine? <laughs> so yeah. it's nice well, to see now they come I away excited. Do. What I could do, Daniel, if you like, you know, uh, and I, I would ask my participants first, you know, that I send you the list of the names and email addresses of my participants to you and you send then your book. Or Was that your idea? Either way, however it works for you. Yeah, I, I, I will think about it. I will think about it. Yeah. Okay. Right. Christina, you had a question? I, okay. I want to know yeah, so how you Vincent, guys met. Yeah, so Vincent, you're asking 
how I met Kai. So it was yeah. interesting, right? I had, I had heard about this uh, this program, and I'm I'm I guess sort of a, a medical education junkie, as people probably know. You know, my MD, <laughs> my PhD, my <laughs> tropical medicine. Um, and so I heard about this and uh, initially was trying to get involved. And then I ended up going to um, Ghana and arrived a little bit early because I wanted to go uh, to the University of Ghana School of Medicine. I wanted to meet with the dean. We had sent them books. And then I met Kai there in Accra. And it was so funny because the first night I'm meeting Kai and the group, and that was actually when Aisha comes over, just as I'm meeting Kai. <laughs> and Aisha's like, I think we know each other. <laughs> but we're of course wearing our masks, you know, yeah. and she takes down her mask and she's like, Daniel, like Daniel Griffin, like from Thailand, <laughs> like Aisha. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah, we met in Accra, uh, Ghana was the first time. And then mm. we kept in touch and yeah, we just were together again in Uganda. So. Mm. Cool. Very good. Well, anything else we can uh, give away a book now if you'd like. Well, we could maybe talk a little bit about hybridization and chistosomes because that is really quite interesting. Uh, Although um, I, I didn't really prepare for a scientific <laughs> discussion. <laughs> but I, no, I it's, it is. Back. Yeah, it is interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just returned from Malawi just a, a month ago and I actually had the opportunity to speak to Janelisa Musaya, who was just preparing for a field excursion with her lab uh, and they were actually going to collect... Um, um, snails and samples of schistosomes just, just to establish what kind of hybrids are out there um, just to kind of an epidemiological survey so uh, I think that will be really interesting to, to find out you know if these hybridizations occur more commonly than we think they maybe do So we should say something about why people don't get schistosoma bovis although there have been some rare cases but now, because it's hybridized with one we do get, it sounds like a permissive versus non-permissive host. Uh, it somehow hybridization with schistosoma hematobium allows schistosoma bovis to now gain entrance into the human host, and uh, that's that's a quite different situation than the viruses have when they uh, jump from one host to another. But um, it's it's very interesting to think about what the factors might be that would allow the entry of the parasite into the host. And not only does it go into the host, it infects the host. It, it, it establishes a yeah, real infection. And, <clears throat> yeah, and hybridization enhances infectivity. Yeah. And it and, uh, enhances uh, uh, virulence. And it uh, also accelerates uh, sacarial maturation, you know? Uh, that's so it somehow... It triggers off um, the infection even more. Right. So we can actually do those experiments now. You can transfect these animals, right? And find out which yes. of the genes are really important for hybridization and infection. Yeah. That's exciting stuff. Is it stuff. that the cercaria cannot penetrate or do they get stuck? Because they I know the no, duck schistosomes in Loch Lomond, you know, you can get a swimmer sitch, but right. the infection doesn't progress any further. So I wonder if there's maybe an arrest somewhere in the migration. I have no idea. So but, S, S bovis you know. does penetrate the skin, but it stops just like the other non-human mm. schistosomes, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But apparently uh, it gets the go-ahead once it's hybridized with a... Uh, mm. Uh, a known human parasite. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, we should all come together like this on this subject because I received an email recently from a friend of mine down at the University of Georgia. We had one of the students uh, from the University of Georgia write in with a guess. One of the world leaders in schistosomiasis research, Dan Colley, uh, has just... Um, announced his retirement. So my friend, uh, who uh, Donald Harn, I used to contact with at Harvard, who then went down to University of Georgia, said, uh, just informed me like yesterday, I think, that Dan Colley will no longer be a, a laboratory um, giant that he has become. And I know that he was very interested in situations like this, of um, non-human parasites hybridizing or getting together in some way that we don't know about, 
Um, and imagine where the hybridization occurs, right? It doesn't occur in the human. It probably occurs in the snail. All right. Mm-hmm. So the snail host contains all of these unusual stages of this parasite, and you can just see the chromosomes and the genes trading back and forth between the S. bovis and the S. hematobium inside of a Bulinus snail, and then out pops this different zecaria that can now, you know, taste human flesh as well as, well as beef. <laughs> Yeah, and also they have a wider host spectrum, eh, also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That must and be that, right that's also yes, it's also an, an issue, you know. <laughs> so you got you got more hosts. Can the can the hybrid that infects humans go back and infect um, uh, cattle also? Is that is that true? Do we know? So will will eggs from this hybrid from humans? produce a carrier mm-hmm. that can then penetrate back into cattle and, you know, sort of spill back, as they would say in virology, I guess, right? Yeah. We don't know. No, we don't know. So I, these, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Anybody someone, really, one of our listeners knows. They'll email in. Because you can <laughs> imagine how much, how much cattle, how many different species of cattle there are out there and how many of them uh, are aquatic and how many uh, countries raise rice, for instance, and they use those cattle for plowing those rice fields. And it's just, mm-hmm. a, and in China, there's another version of this, of course, with Mekongai and, and, um, and Japonicum. So uh, you wonder whether or not any of that is going to mm-hmm. result in a wider, wider net of casting the net into uh, the human population, another emerging infection that we thought we would never have to worry about, and here we are worried mm-hmm. about it. Kai, do you know whether these hybrids can now infect both um, the different snail species of these different species? Because that would also expand the kind of the like, geographic range where they can go. Like rats and things I, I like don't have any data uh, on that, but uh, why not? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's pos- I think it's, po- it's possible. Yeah. Hmm. I can see a lot of summer research projects. I'll say. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> and just when you thought you understood what a species was. <laughs> yeah. This challenges that concept very much so. Yeah. All right, are we ready to give away a book? We are. Books. The drummer is about to roll. We had, we had 17 guesses. And... I'm going to pick a random number. Let's see. Number 14. <laughs> 14 is... Kyle, you should join the show. <laughs> you have to join the show because your laughter is infectious. <laughs> so, Christopher from, from the University of California, Berkeley. And uh, Christopher, right. send, send your address, vincent at microbe.tv. And, yeah, um, say hello no, to uh, no, your not, professors. I've published a bunch with those guys. So. Actually, that's the wrong email. Twip at microbe.tv. <laughs> T-W-I-P at microbe.tv. That's right. And I will ship you out an autographed copy. And right. now, Daniel, do you, uh, you have anything else for us? Um, he's he's going to be out of cases cool, there, now. Are some, there, <laughs> there are some cool emails here, but I guess we'll hold them for later. But I That's do cool. have another case. All right. All right. Um, so, so you know, when I when I hang out with uh, Kai, I sort of wander off every so often. Sometimes Kai introduces me to someone, and then I'm off and gone, and wondering where everyone else has gone. Well, this was a situation in in Tebe where I wandered off, um, and uh, well, I was sort of glad to have wandered off because it was a very interesting uh, clinical case that I was able to learn about. Um, and so, where is Entebbe? So, Entebbe is in um, is in Uganda. And if you want to go to Uganda, that's, this is where the international airport. There's actually been some movies that have actually featured shots seven days in Entebbe. Um, so this is a little bit southwest of the capital. It's right on the lake. Um, and there's really a mix. I mean, there, there are some really uh, people doing well and living in, in really good situations. And then there's uh, our patient um, who's living in really limited conditions. So here we have a boy. Uh, less than age 10, who grows up in very limited conditions, dirt floor home, um, multiple siblings, and he presents with recurrent right upper abdominal pain, 
um, keeps having these episodes for a few days, right, of quadrant pain, fevers. Um, he actually undergoes some blood work that shows eosinophilia. Um, and with these recurrent episodes, they actually perform an abdominal ultrasound of that right upper quadrant. And it uh, shows what looks like a mobile piece of spaghetti in the gallbladder along with dilated biliary ducts. Um, he also has a stool examination performed. And next week, we're going to hear uh, what, what could this be and what, what do you do next? Next month. Next month. <laughs> <laughs> Can you be more specific about the kind of spaghetti? Is this linguine? Is this uh, thin <laughs> spaghetti? <laughs> Is this angel hair? But give us give us a little bit of a, <laughs> a benchmark here. <laughs> Is it with that's, white that's sauce, you, red that's sauce? All, that's all you get. I feel like Too last bad. time, boy, people did pretty darn well. So I'm expecting, you know, this is like when you're up there in front of your class and you're expecting, uh, you know, participation. Um, yeah, right. I'm hoping for some good email participation. Actually, when are we recording next time, Christina? Do we have that on our uh, schedule? Yeah. Oh, um, y y we probably do. Let me see. How do I get to my own Google Docs? While you're doing that, Daniel, is uh, any anybody else in the boys' family have uh, similar issues? No, he's, he's the only one who keeps having these recurrent right upper uh, quadruped pains in his belly. And and so the the only thing we know is that dirt dirt floor, there's no water involved here, Daniel, right? Uh, you know, it's interesting. He does, you know, and Tebby is right there by uh, Lake Victoria. So there's there, there's a lake nearby, but we're not we're not getting any of that in our history. Okay. Is abdominal not distended or ab abdomen distended? Do we know? Or should I you ask? Know, it, it is. No, I think it's okay to ask, and I'll throw a little another clue in there. He does have a pretty distended abdomen. Okay. You know, and he does appear a little young, younger than stated age, though. So. Right. I don't want to give too much just, away. Uh, I was just about to ask <laughs> if he's maybe stunted. Yeah, uh, there appears to be some stunting. So maybe yeah, okay. this little bit of spaghetti is not the only spaghetti that's causing him mm. some trouble. Any jaundice? <laughs> Any jaundice? <laughs> I feel like you got enough there, Dixon. Uh, in other words, just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, I find the date. I think Daniel you noted it down as the third of March. No, the twenty third of March. Sorry, because you write your dates the other way round from us. <laughs> so I, got that, I got that muddled up. So the twenty third of March or thereabouts. Okay. Sounds okay. good. Very good. All right, that'll do it for TWIP 214. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIP. You can send in your guesses to twip at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy our work, consider supporting us so that we can continue. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Our guest today, Kai Schaefer from Trop Medex. Thank you for joining us, Kai. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kai. Thank, Thank you, you also for staying up so late. See you. You take care. Be safe. <laughs> Feel don't good with kite. Feel good with the kite. But don't leave yet. Don't, don't leave yet, please. No, no, no. Okay. Daniel Griffin is at uh, Columbia University Irving Medical Center, parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thanks, Daniel. Hey, thank you. And everyone, be safe. Dixon de Pommier, trichinella.org, thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. Yep. That was great. I love this international flavor that we've developed. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's really good. And Christina Nall is at the University of Glasgow. Thanks, Christina. Thank you. This was great fun. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIP and Ronald Jenkins for the music. Who's going to do our sign-off today? I, I think our, it guest, it's our my, guest it's, should do it's it. It's my it. turn, right? Oh, no, actually, Daniel, sorry, right. you got to do it. All right, yeah, but you have turn. to. It's Daniel's turn. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> viel, vielen Dank für alles. Es, 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 es war mir eine Ehre. <laughs> und, und ich hoffe, wir sehen uns bald wieder. It was an honor, and I hope I see you soon again. <laughs> okay. Right, Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip. 
is parasitic. <laughs>